Oh, my God. I'm your biggest Hello and welcome to I'm Your Biggest Fan, the podcast that chats to your favourite artists about their favourite artists. I'm your host, Jasmine Lammy, in conjunction with the Noise Podcast Network and Satanic Tico. Today, I cannot be more excited because not only are we talking about, obviously, someone else's favourite band, but this is also one of my all-time favourite bands. I even have a tattoo of them. No, it's not Guns N' Roses or Hailstorm, for anyone that knows me. <laughs> Today, I get to talk about Iron Maiden. So, for for anyone that's living under a rock, Iron Maiden currently have 17 studio albums, not to mention live albums, greatest hits. I can't even remember the last time they released an EP, but they've probably got a few of those in there somewhere as well. Um, And this this was one of the bands that set off my adoration for heavy music and is is the band me and my dad bond over the most. Like, this is our thing. Um, So today, my guest is guitarist and vocalist for the Cambridge-based alternative rock band Brave Liaison, alternatively known as Tom Lumley and the Brave Liaison. Therefore, you've guessed it, my host today is guitarist and vocalist Tom Lumley of the Brave Liaison. So sit back, relax, and listen to us whilst we chat about how Iron Maiden have had an influence on their two EPs and one full-length studio album, the time he met Nico McBrain, the fact that his first ever concert whilst he was growing up in Spain was Iron Maiden with his guitar tutor at the time, uh, why he thinks Iron Maiden need to turn their songwriting attentions to (laughs) the underwater lives of sharks and for anyone that follows me personally on social media particularly instagram will get this reference but uh snooping around in the background tom also gets caged (laughs) so yeah tune in here we go here's our chat It's basically just an opportunity for you to like let your guard down and revert back to the bands and the reasons that got you into music in the first place. And the band you've chosen to talk about today is Iron Maiden, which yep. I'm super excited about because they're also one of my favorite bands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess the first question is, do you remember the first time you ever heard Iron Maiden? uh yeah it would probably have been like a couple of years before the first time i saw them and it was um two minutes to midnight and just like remember hearing it and just thinking yeah i want to play that and then learn it and then that was it really that was when the obsession started do you remember like where you heard that song was it it wouldn't have been on the radio but i was at um there was a guy who I had guitar lessons with at like a performing arts academy and we were in like his little studio thing and I remember him putting it on and I was just like yeah that's cool <laughs> <laughs> he was like listen to this do you want to play this absolutely yeah that's that's definitely yes <laughs> how long did it take you to learn it oh I'm not sure I, w- I can't remember now to be fair I mean we're talking like a good what, 15 years ago now so <laughs> So how old would you have been when you heard that? Um, I think that I, I would have been probably about 12 or 13. Nice. That's a good age for it as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, I'd, I'd been into other music before then. But that was, yeah, I was massively into like Guns N' Roses and ACDC and stuff. But for some reason, I'd never really given Iron Maiden the time of day until then. And then it was like, yeah, sweet. This mm-hmm. is cool. So like listening to acdc and guns N' roses before hearing iron maiden when you did hear like two minutes to midnight 
for the first time. What was it about them and that song in particular that stood out against like everything else that you've been listening to at that time? Um, I think I just always loved the way, like their guitar parts, the way they harmonized them with having several guitarists in the band. Um, that sort of like melodic sound that they get that that always hit home and I really like that so um that's that's probably it really I, I always loved Nico on the drums as well like just so cool to watch <laughs> he's an absolute monster behind the kit <laughs> yeah I met him once and he was like one of the nicest guys ever as well which was really cool because you kind of worry what people are going to be like but yeah he was really cool I find Iron Maiden's a really interesting anomaly because they are quite literally one of the biggest bands on the planet and have never not been successful. Like even on some of their like lesser successful albums, like they're still, they've still always been at the top yet. They're still some of the most nicest, most humble people around. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. I think that's a good thing though. Like, yeah, that's, absolutely. It, all people should be like that. <laughs> <laughs> So you mentioned there that Two Minutes to Midnight was the first song you heard. I find for me, a lot of the time, the first song I hear from a band, because it holds so much like nostalgia and meaning, it will always be one of my favourite songs. So yeah. is Two Minutes to Midnight one of your favourite Iron Maiden songs or do you have a different one since then? It's definitely one of my favourites, but it's not my fav favourite favourite. Favourite favourite Fear of the Dark. It, I don't know why. It always has been. It's one of my favourite like I made in songs to play when I learned it. Mm -hmm. Of the guitar parts. Um, so I remember seeing them live for the first time and uh just like when they played that live, it was it was already probably my favourite song and then that solidified it. Like Bruce climbed up the all the rigging on the stage and stuff and I just thought, yeah, that's cool. I don't know why, but it just... <laughs> it's it... definitely one of those songs as well, especially live, because I, I had exactly the same experience the first time I saw them live and heard that song. And, yeah. like, the song on record anyway really captures, like, the eeriness of, yeah, yeah. like, walking alone by yourself at night. But then hearing it live and hearing, like, an entire stadium also sing along to it just somehow made it like, extra eerie extra creepy extra atmospheric it's like quite literally one of those like spine tingling moments <laughs> yeah definitely i agree and that's like i think that's probably what i like about it most it's kind of got everything it's got that eeriness the slower part the sort of with all the feeling and then it's just got like where it just picks up tempo and just goes for it so it's got it's got the best of both worlds yeah that's good i think as well i think that album was the first album artwork that featured an Eddie that wasn't designed by Derek Riggs. Oh, really? I didn't I know that. I think, yeah. yeah, I'm gonna have to double check that after this, but yeah, yeah. I think it was the first, um, I wanna say like fan made. Yeah. I think. That's well, cool that's... if that's true. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Cause it, he, like that fear of the dark, Eddie looks so different to all of the ones before it. I think that was the first time they did did it without their original illustrator. <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously Rave Liaison have one full-length album and two EPs. How does your love of Iron Maiden influence your own music writing? Because like stylistically, they're quite a there's a big gap between what you would yeah. expect from Iron Maiden and what you get with Rave Liaison. Yeah, 100%. I think um, although Iron Maiden kind of growing up were like my favourite band, I'd say, not that I, I'm still obviously a big fan of them, but I'd say over like the last sort of five years or so, not as much so, so it probably hasn't influenced our music as much. Mm -hmm. uh, like you say, you can you can hear that when you when you listen, it's like completely different. But that, that wasn't, it's not that I don't like Iron Maiden now, it's just... Um, Growing up, I was also always into like your pop punk stuff or like your Paramore, My Chemical Romance, and all that side of of the rock side of things. And I think those bands have definitely come through more in our own writing and, and sound. I think it's also probably to do with the fact that 
I know I wouldn't be able to sing like the lead singer of Iron Maiden. So <laughs> <laughs> if we tried to make music like them, it just wouldn't work. Maybe and like I think my voice is better suited to to yeah, like the more alternative rock stuff that we do. Well, I guess if you were going to cover like any Iron Maiden song, if you did it from the first two albums when they had a slightly punkier edge, then it might work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could go for that. <laughs> <laughs> You could just like rewrite an Iron Maiden song, but in the style of Brave Liaison. <laughs> yeah, we could give it a go. That would be really cool to do, actually. Now think about it, like that kind of like when people do Radio One Live Lounge Cup and they just change the song up completely. Like, yeah, just... I love that shit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, what other like bands and music are the rest of your bandmates into then? Talking about the um, like style of Brave Liaison. Yeah, so Jake's, um, he was like massively a pop punk person, which is probably where myself and Jake cross over and like that sort of sound that we've got comes from. But he's also like, Foo Fighters were massive for Jake. Uh, Bill is absolutely obsessed with Muse and right. always, always will be. I think there's basically not anything really that he doesn't know about them, which is, he's he is a super fan of Muse. <laughs> and then, <laughs> Uh, Johnny's different. Like Johnny, just I don't know how to describe Johnny's music taste. He will literally listen. Like he just loves like Stevie Wonder, like that. But then he would also like. Then he had like massive catfish in the bottom end stage, but then he also likes. He's obsessed with Foo Fighters as well. So, but is he a fan of bands like Dying Fetus? <laughs> uh, no. <it's> not. <laughs> <laughs> so he doesn't listen to everything. Okay, there's always one no. genre. Those everything people. Yeah. Don't fall I into. Mean, I don't know if he's ever tried Dying Fetus. So, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> You'll have to show him afterwards and be like, look what our publicist is trying to get us into. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be interesting. I'd love for you to like record a live reaction as well for that. <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> oh, amazing. So, you mentioned before as well that you've seen them live in concert. How many times? I have seen them twice, which is not as many times as I'd like to have seen them. Okay. When was the first? First one was, I'm trying to think exactly what year it was, but I believe it was 2012. And it was a, I grew up in Spain, so I lived there. So that's kind of a big part as well as why I hadn't seen them so much. Because right. where we lived, it's like whenever they came on tour, it was always like Barcelona and Madrid, and we were like five hours from each, and it just didn't always work out that we could go. Yeah. So, um, but the first time I saw them, they played Valencia, which was like a couple of hours away, and my guitar teacher, who was um, who played me Two Minutes to Midnight, that got me into Iron Maiden. He was like, "We're going," and that was it, basically. And um, yeah, so they played in Valencia. It was a massive open air gig on the poor area in Valencia, which was like insane. It was like just being at a festival really, but with just Iron Maiden playing the whole night. And they were supported by a band, I believe from Germany called Ed Guy. Okay. Not heard of them. Uh, they were awesome. They were just, they're just like another Iron Maiden to be honest. But, <laughs> so yeah, that was the first night and it was the final frontier tour. So that had been 2012. It had been around then. It's the first time I saw them too. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It was it was it was mega, like so good. So you say you went with your guitar teacher. Are you yeah. just, like still in touch with them? Because that's quite a big thing, like, like quite a big thing to bond over something so yeah. significant like that. Um, not so much now. Um, not for any reason other than kind of uh, he moved away from Spain and I moved back to England as well. So um, it's not that don't have any contact, but yeah, don't really speak a lot now um but yeah maybe one day like get together and go to another Iron Maiden gig or something that'd be cool oh, that'd be so wholesome <laughs> yeah yes <laughs> <laughs> so how was it like did you have any expectations going in to see Iron Maiden um it was my first ever gig as well so Sick. so it was like I kind of didn't know what to expect and I think it obviously well, when I say first ever gig, obviously saw like, I don't know, especially where I lived in Spain, like cover bands in like pubs and stuff. But it was the first pro going to a proper concert, proper 
proper show and I didn't really know what to expect but I think it couldn't have really been any better than like a starting point because the fact it was Iron Maiden but then also like massive open air gig with like 80,000 people in Valencia just mad the atmosphere was incredible 80,000 people cool. yeah it was it was big for like a one-off gig it was huge I just remember leaving like the when we left the gig on the way out like just crowds and crowds of people still singing Iron Maiden songs just like walking for like an hour just singing Iron Maiden songs it was mad I love that it's like a yeah. heavy metal conga line yeah literally what it was like yeah. <laughs> one of my favorite things about going to see Iron Maiden is that they are literally the kings of band merch and band shirts yeah yeah literally and, and I've seen them, I've only ever seen them at the O2 Arena and Downloads. And I've been to a couple of gigs at the O2 now. And every time I go see Iron Maiden, it's such a different atmosphere. Yeah. Because like, you go see any other band and there'll be multiple band shirts of like different bands. But Maiden, if you turn up to a Maiden gig and you're not in a Maiden shirt, what are you doing? <laughs> so that is the thing with them. It's like the well, the shirts and like the designs and stuff like say like the eddies that are on them. They're just so renowned for everyone wearing them. So you just you don't not. Yeah, there's like so many different variations as well. There's there is literally yeah. something for everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't like I've still got my original Iron Maiden tops and like the one from that gig in Valencia and stuff. But I haven't even like looked at them for a while. But I've still kept them. I know that because I'm just like. I need to keep them. And I've yeah. bought like a Mac Final Frontier um, like flag, banner, whatever we're going to go with. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, if a couple of years later with the same guitar teacher or even a year later, we went to like a guitar expo thing in at the Excel, I think it was in London. And um yeah we flew over because steve vi was doing it and i was obsessed with steve vi at the time as well mm -hmm. so we flew over for that but nico was doing the chat and that was where we met him and he signed the um the banner so i've still got that somewhere but oh. yeah that's that's staying safe <laughs> that's cool i'm surprised you don't have that like framed and pride of place on your wall <laughs> yeah i'm really bad for like anything that i've got that would be really cool being framed i just haven't like I ran the London Marathon a couple of years ago and I was like, yeah, I've got my T-shirt from it, I've got my shorts from it, I've got my medal, whatever, my um, number and everything. And I was just like, I'm going to keep all of that and frame it. And that's <laughs> like two, you like in my drawer. It's a lot easier said than done. <laughs> yeah, I just look at it and I'm like, oh, that'd be really cool frame. Then you're like, you go and look at the cost of it and you're like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that another day. <laughs> yeah, I've got, um, so my ex stepmom used to, okay work in sports direct in Essex before she moved over with my dad and my dad is a bigger Iron Maiden fan than me like absolutely his favorite band and turns out like she's not into metal at all but turns out Steve Harris would always go into sports direct with his um with his son and like buy things so she'd met him a few times without knowing who it was and as soon yeah. as my dad found out he was like please get things signed for us <laughs> so I've got a framed Iron Maiden poster that my dad got framed for me and in the bottom corner is a little piece of paper that says hey Jasmine keep rocking lots of love Steve Harris I've not met him but that's still pretty cool but he did have to he had to spell my name three times before he got it right apparently so <laughs> that's really cool I feel like secondhand guilty that he had to do it that many times <laughs> Uh, I see your fault. <laughs> <laughs> but it wouldn't have been the same if it was spelt wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've got, um, it's just, I don't know why it's just made me think, but the company that I do like my day job for, <laughs> mm -hmm. we've got um, another office down in Braintree and there's a guy that works for us called Smurf who I never believed this when I first met him. They were like, oh, he's got an amazing voice. And apparently, like, at one point it was between him and and Bruce for who was going to be the singer. What? That's me. Yeah, and I was like, I don't believe this. And then someone showed me a video of him singing in like a pub with a band. And like, yeah, you can see like 
exactly why he would be a singer for Iron Maiden if he'd have got it. Fucking hell, that's mad. Imagine like almost being the singer for Iron Maiden and then working for a yeah a telecoms yeah. company. <laughs> yeah, me <laughs> that. <though. laughs> that's good. I mean, he could definitely imagine if he started his own. Oh, you guys could start your own Iron Maiden tribute band. Yeah, exactly. That's the way we're going to go. <laughs> Is it put Nick Cage behind you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do. Is it, like, first time you like moved your head, I was like, oh my God, there's someone in the room. And I was like, I will cut out of Nicolas Cage. So, tangent, but one of my housemates, she's obsessed with the Nicolas Cage. Um, and one of her friends ordered her a life-size cutout of him whilst she was away. And okay. he was like, hey, I've ordered this for Aman. Can you hide it in her room somewhere for when she gets back? So, but it also came with one of those like head on a stick ones. Okay, yeah. So I put him just behind her door and it scared the shit out of her. <laughs> and then she was none the wiser and then she was about to get into bed and I'd hidden the head in her bed as well. Oh no. <laughs> and now as a household, we just like, we have this little game that we play now where we try and cage each other. We just put, uh- we just put him in the randomest of places, so. You've been caged. <laughs> you, you, you did cage me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Okay, back to the topic at hand. Yeah. Um, so you've seen Maiden twice. When was the second time? The second time was in Madrid, and it was maybe a few years later. And it was, um, yeah, it was good. It was just a big arena show. Mm. What show, Tour Cycle, was that one on? I'm trying to think. I feel like it would have been around 2015 or 2014. I'm trying to think now in my head. I'm trying to put the dots together of when I moved back to England. <laughs> I feel like when I was younger, I remembered every single gig I went to, like when they were and everything like that. And I've got to an age now where I've just been to so many gigs and so many festivals. that I've, And I always said like, oh no, I'd keep every wristband, every ticket. I'll keep track of it all. I just haven't. And I'm really disappointed in myself that I haven't. <laughs> Maybe so, this will be the kick up the ass that you need to. Yeah, I get also on it. could have done some research on the gigs I've been to remember before doing this. <laughs> I think I've seen them four times. <clears throat> First time was Final Frontier, and then they did what was it? Oh, was it? There was a Greatest Hits tour. Yeah. I can't remember what it was called. I want to say it had Beast in it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I want to say Best of the Beast, but I feel like that was ages ago. Anyway, Greatest Hits Tour, and then Book of Souls, and then I saw them headline download, which was cool. Yeah. What you did with the download headline that you saw? It 2022? Okay, yeah, that was that. It's the year I'm thinking of. I like very nearly bought day tickets to go, and then I didn't. But that, that's that's sad, really, because I just wish there's so many times I've not been to download yet, and like I don't know why. Because every year I'm like, yeah, this year I'm gonna go download, and then just things always get in the way. But yeah, I get that. I mean, I, I mean, I guess kind of similar to you. Like I grew up on the island of jersey (laughs) yeah Uh, so like there was absolutely no music scene where i grew up like if we if i wanted to go to a gig you had to buy a flight to the uk make sure you had accommodation get travel plus the ticket like it would cost you a bomb so the only concerts that made sense to go to were the arena ones you know like you wouldn't pay because yeah. you would also have to take off like three days of work to yeah. go so it wasn't until I moved to uni in Brighton that I started traveling to London like every weekend and actually going to gigs and I I did download for the first time in 2018 and then I was I work in the music industry now so I'm very lucky that I get to I get to go every year now <laughs> <laughs> yeah we I've been talking about going this year uh, well, next year, 2024, but I think it might be the year. Have you seen the lineup yet? Yeah, yeah, and I rate it. I rate the fact that Fallout Boy are headlining, to be honest. So. Yeah, 
I, it's it's been really interesting because everyone's been complaining about having the same headliners every year and this and is the it, first time they've got two headliners that have never headlined before and people are still kicking off about it yeah no one's ever happy <laughs> literally literally i feel so sorry for them because they have done what people want to do and i'm definitely on the side of the fence that agrees that i'm all here for it. i feel like they're trying to push forward and they're giving the newer stuff and like a different side of rock a chance, which I think is good in the current climate. Yeah, I yeah I agree as well. I saw Avenged Sevenfold also headline download in 2018, but both Fall Out Boy and Queens of the Stone Age I've missed out on seeing this year. So yeah. getting to see them next year worked perfectly for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was absolutely gutted. I, I, was, I went to go to Fall Out Boy's tour, but couldn't go. But I am going to see Queens of the Stone Age on Wednesday. So oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> they've seen them before they're very good oh that's good they're um they're my ex's favorite band so <laughs> I've, kind, I've kind of like well that, no, that's like a good thing like you got me into I, them so <laughs> i kind of like i wouldn't have gone to see them off my own back but because i now like know so much information about them secondhand that i would enjoy seeing them seeing them yeah yeah that's what it's kind of always been like for me it was I saw them at a festival and they were better live than I expected and kind of knew like the obvious songs and that's it. Um, but yeah, a friend asked me if I wanted to go on Wednesday and I was like, it's, it's free tickets. So I was like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm hoping, I'm hoping I can still go. Maybe I'm asking around, but yeah. I'm holding my breath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trying to work. Yeah. You'll have to let me know how it is. That'd be really cool. I will do. <laughs> So, but back to Iron Maiden. Um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so they have quite an impressive discography and back catalogue. Out of their 17 studio albums, which one is your favourite? I don't know. And I knew this <laughs> was a question. Because, like, Fear of the Dark album, it jumps out for the obvious reasons that we've already spoke about. Mm -hmm. But I feel like there is probably Final Frontier album really sticks with me probably because it's the first show I went to. Makes sense. So, but then like Number of the Beasts is so they're the three, and out of them three, I don't know. Okay, so they're like I'm coming out here. <laughs> <laughs> You're taking the safe route. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, yeah. And um, if I'm being totally honest, Fear of the Dark album is probably only because Fear of the Dark's on it, because the rest of the album for me isn't my favourite album. So we've, we've taken that one out of the race. <laughs> and now okay. I'm down to... Process of elimination, I like it. <laughs> I'm going to go with Final Frontier just because of what it means. Like, Yeah. That, that's yeah. it. That's quite interesting because I guess... It's like... not... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, like, from the songs on it, obviously, besides the fact that it was the album cycle that you saw them on, um, like out of the songs on that album, why do they stand out to you? I guess like like El Dorado. Oh, that is a tune. It is, and I just remember like it, I just got into Iron Maiden. It was the first time I was gonna I was gonna go and see them, and it was. Like I just remember being so excited about the the release of something new, and mm -hmm. kind of like heard all this stuff that's been around for years that I liked, but this was going to be the first thing that I could be like, oh, I remember when it was released, or and just like waiting to like go on YouTube and listen to it. So I think it yeah it has that like special connection still because of of that reason. It's the first time of. Everything else was accessible. Everything else they'd done before was always there, obviously. So it was the mm. first time of tired of waiting for something to come. Yeah, I guess it was like the first time you felt a part of it. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when um, El Dorado came out as well, and like I've always, I've always loved history, uh, especially like ancient history, and yeah. like the Mayans and the Egyptians, and I think that's why I liked Iron Maiden a lot. Because 
I learned I learned so much more about history from Iron Maiden songs than I ever did inside it, a classroom. Yeah. Basically, yeah. I actually did my um my university dissertation on the importance of and like the educational value of Iron Maiden lyrics. That's super. <laughs> it was really. I basically just got to look, like all my non metalhead friends to listen to Iron Maiden and be like, "What do you think this song is about?" And they nailed yeah. it. So I was like, I "Knew it." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, with um, El Dorado, obviously, it's about the um, like lost city of gold in Mexico, yeah. and there's a movie as well called Road to El Dorado. So I've kind of like piece those two things together even though they're totally different because one's a cartoon and one's a metal band <laughs> but yeah but they, they, they link to the same thing yeah exactly i remember as well like around that time like when they i made in like it's the first time that i realized that bruce flew his own plane like the tour plane as well and i just remember thinking well that's just sick but also he must be knackered that was the other thing i kept thinking was surely he is tired like <laughs> Yeah, I'm I've seen very recently that he's um he's given up on flying I think commercial airlines now. Yeah. So I think he'd still be flying Air Force One, but he also did he did a stint flying for British Airways at one point. Like imagine yeah. just being on a plane and just hearing, This is your captain speaking, I'm Bruce Dickinson. <laughs> I <would laughs> nice. shit myself. <laughs> yeah. <Although> I- <laughs> <laughs> Have you I ever don't... seen the plane? Uh, in person, mm-hmm. no. I s- saw it just by like absolute luck and surprise. I was on a really long journey to Australia in like 2009, okay. I want to say. And I'd never been anywhere that far before. And I was with my dad and my mum. And we were just like, I think in Dubai airport uh, on a stopover. We just looked out the window and there was the fucking Ed Force One plane in all its glory, just dwarfing all these other little like shitty non-exciting planes. <laughs> That's so <laughs> Didn't they do like a I might be wrong, but with the Final Frontier album, I feel like I remember them doing like a little documentary thing where people got to like fly on the plane. Yeah, yeah, that that happened. Yeah. You haven't made that no. up. <laughs> no, no, I'm just asking, I don't know what <laughs> some reason it's like in the back of my head but i can't fully really remember it i just remember thinking like how do you do that like, how do you get on that plane like, <laughs> yeah that would have been cool i would have liked that yeah definitely um so on the other side of things what which of their albums did you find underwhelming let's um... get into controversial territory here Oof, I'm, I'm not sure of that. What's um, I'm trying to think. What was the album that came after Final Frontier? Not there because it greatest hits, but then it was Book of Souls. Yeah, I, I'm guessing already by the sigh. <laughs> it's the one I've got. I've got it tattooed. <laughs> Book of Souls didn't as much. I, but I... I also don't know if that was just because of maybe like me having a slight change in what I was listening to more because of what we were playing as a band. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's to do with it. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. I can also kind of see, like, there's not as many... Oh, no, because they've had one since then. They've got Senjutsu now. Totally forgot about that one. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I liked... um, What I liked the most about Book of Souls was the last song on the album, Empire of the Clouds, which is their longest song at 20 minutes. Yeah, and it does not feel like twenty minutes, and it's the first time Bruce Dickinson has ever played piano on a song as well. Yeah, and it just just... see, yeah, I think I have a different interpretation of twenty minutes. Like for me, (laughs) I don't know. It just felt felt too long. I I mean, it's half the album, so yeah, yeah, literally. I feel like my cutoff point with like length of songs is kind of like guns and roses november rain seven minutes sort of period ducks what seven and a half is it or something similar something that rings a bell yeah i think that 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 yeah so what do you think of rhyme with the ancient mariner then at 13 minutes yeah it's (laughs) it's long but (laughs) 
You like the short I, and snappy ones. I, well, yeah. I do... If the song's got enough changes that keep it interesting, which they do normally, to, to be fair, then yes. But I am definitely... I guess that comes with me being slightly... can be a slightly impatient person that I'm like, right, I've enjoyed this, but now I want to hear the next thing. And yeah. although some of the songs... Like Fear of the Dark it just feels like it's got so many different parts to it. So you don't lose interest. It does feel sometimes like you're going into a different song. But yeah, I think if like you refer to Brave Liaison's music, like all of our songs are like <laughs> three minutes. We've even got like songs that are two minutes, which I've always liked. Great for radio. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's maybe why we started doing it at first. I don't know, but... <laughs> I, like, one of my favourite songs as well ever, like this is completely away from Iron Maiden, but Blur song too, and that's just like such right. a short, snappy song. But, sometimes that's what you need. Yeah, yeah. And then sometimes you do need a, a Fear of the Dark sort of that's nice, true. take you on a journey. My, um, my favourite Iron Maiden song is Passion Dale. Okay, yeah. And I think, like you said there, like it's one of those songs that has it takes you on a journey like it's got loads of different segments and it builds up really well and then gets quiet again and i'm like such a good song yeah it's got everything yeah <laughs> okay here's a big question for you if you had to direct someone listening to iron maiden for the first time which three songs would you tell them to listen to that encapsulates iron maiden perfectly um oh. See, Two Minutes to Midnight is probably because it, it caught me so well and got that's, me so made in. Also, my dad's uh, phone ringtone. Is I it? also got um, I got a couple of tattoos a couple of months ago on like my, my, like my hip bones. I got yep. 666 on one side and on the other side I got 1158. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Yep. That that's sick. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, carry on. It's like the the thing is, is like I've never even thought about the fact like two minutes to midnight, but yeah, eleven fifty eight. Yeah, that's cool. Um, two minutes to midnight, maybe because of like the effect it had on me. Mm -hmm. I mean, fear of the dark is. I'm definitely telling whoever that they need to listen to fear of the dark. That's. I think we've made it very clear that I'm obsessed with that song. <laughs> um, Trooper is an absolute. Mm. Dude, I think. Um, well, actually, thinking about it, Two Minutes to Midnight was not the first time that I listened to Iron Maiden, but it was the first time that I knew that they were Iron Maiden. Yeah. Because I used to play a snowboard game that had Run to the Hills on it. Okay, yeah. It, I'm sure it was like SSX Tricky or something like that, and it had Run to the Hills on it. And didn't one of the guitar heroes had it on as well? Yeah, most likely. I think a few of the different guitar heroes had different Maiden songs on them. Yeah. So, mm, this is where I, I'm just so indecisive. <laughs> well, I'm moment. Fear, fear the Dark, definitely. Uh, two Minutes to Midnight because of what the effect it had on me. And then third place, oh, I'm in between Trooper Run to the Hills and El Dorado, just because I think the thing with El Dorado is it gives like a different time span of mm -hmm. I'm, it's like say. modern maiden yeah yeah we'll put Eldorado in there that's the free okay I like that I um speaking about like first time hearing Iron Maiden I'm sure I'd heard my dad listen to them at some point throughout my childhood but the first time I heard them so we used to have a family like computer PC setup and I must have been like 11 I think okay. and I didn't know that my dad was using the computer but I went and like sat on it I put the headphones on and there was like a CD disc in the hard drive that was obviously playing and it was their live at Donington set and the song that was playing as I put those headphones on was bring your daughter to the slaughter yeah yeah and I was like, what the fuck is this? And I opened <laughs> the disk drive and just like the visual of Eddie used to terrify the shit out of me. So when I opened the disk drive and saw that it was, you know, something I was initially scared of, I was like, oh shit, 
I really like this. Yeah. <laughs> and then my dad came up and he was like, what the fuck are you doing on the computer? And I was like, dad, what is this? And I remember him being like, yes, finally, yeah. my time has come. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. That's um, a cool story. Yeah, I like that story. As mentioned before, Iron Maiden have written a lot of songs about different eras um, throughout history, about many different cultures. Um, what would you like to see them write more about? I don't know, to be honest. Like, it would, I would, right, okay. Here we go. <laughs> Very out there, but. Go for it. I, if I was going to pick. I would like to see what Iron Maiden would do with writing about. There's a, I'm obsessed with sharks. All right. Okay. <laughs> like, absolutely obsessed with sharks and something really bad over the last few years has been happening in South Africa, that great white sharks have been getting eaten by k- killer whales. Oh yeah. And now where people used to go cage diving with great white sharks and stuff, there's no great white sharks because they're obviously the ones that survived and migrated because you're not going to go there when you've seen, yeah, so yeah. I would like to see what I made would do writing a song about killer whales killing great white sharks. Oh, they would make it sound so epic as well. Yeah, because it is to imagine like the illustrations that could like the drawings and everything of like single artwork would be oh, epic. You could have Eddie riding an army of killer whales. <laughs> Literally, this is what I'm thinking. Nobody see. It. <laughs> That I, that I, you did not expect that answer, did you? I not that, at all. <laughs> nah. I mean, it's completely different to what they normally write about. But I just think, well, I'd love to see what they did, what they'd do. Yeah, that's true. Because they've like, surely after seventeen studio albums, there's only so many periods and topics in history and different cultures that you can focus yeah. on. Yeah, it's about time yeah, to. So now- SeaWorld got <laughs> yeah. got a spotlight yeah. on it. That's great, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So have you listened to much of their like individual solo projects? Like Bruce Dickinson um has his solo stuff. I know he's about to embark on a new solo project, which is really exciting. Yeah. And then you've obviously got Steve Harris and his band, British Lion. Have you ever taken the time to listen to those? I haven't i'll be totally honest no and i probably should have but (laughs) i've always been really bad for like i'll even admit it now like like even Corey taylor with slipknot i've not listened to i i don't know why but when members break do their own stuff as well i've never really been someone that's got into the solo projects i don't know if that's just because growing up like the first few that maybe i did listen to i just thought were like well, this is rubbish compared. Like, I remember yeah. listening to a very different style of music again and going back to Blur, but Damon Albans solo stuff when he first, like, not Gorillas, but he like he had stuff under his own name. I just remember thinking, I don't really, this isn't grabbing me. Yeah, I think it's difficult as well because it's hard not to go in with expectations. That's the problem, uh, yeah. You, you go in thinking, oh, I love Iron Maiden, so... Uh, you, you already think it's going to sound somewhat like that when really that's not the reality. The reason for a different project is normally yeah. It's different. Uh, yeah, so, I had it. You'd think that, um, so obviously Maiden being mainly Steve Harris's band, you'd think yeah. that British Lion would sound more like Maiden, but it's not something I could get into. I was more partial to Bruce Dickinson's solo stuff so if you are interested I would recommend his album Accident of Birth okay that one was yeah. good if you like All Maiden right. then you might also like that like it's not too far but it's still different okay I'll try that after the meeting when I go back to my wonderful day job <laughs> <laughs> it's a good place to start so, I think. so what's wrong with Steve Harris's stuff Blackline? is it like very punky is it no, it's like, I don't, know, I don't know how I would describe it. Like with Bruce Dickinson stuff, like one of the things that makes Iron Maiden distinct is Bruce's like voice and operatic vocals. Like that 
higher space yeah. whereas i think steve harris's stuff i don't know who sings on it but it's a lot like lower and okay. more i don't know what I would, how i would describe it <clears throat> i just think that if we're comparing the two bruce's stuff just sounds more akin to maiden than yeah, yeah. okay steve's <laughs> well i'll try both and then report back to you <laughs> okay good okay. you be- you better okay. go against my beliefs and i will listen to both <laughs> so obviously going back to the topic of like how insane and impressive their merch game is do you have a favorite album artwork or single artwork there's 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 so uh, many so many and like i don't want it to just keep going back to the same thing because like i've already used the final frontier tour for so many things because it's so like it was the moment that i first got into it all properly but so it is probably going to be that yeah, which is again interesting because it's like the least Eddie looking Eddie. Yeah, yeah. So El Dorado had single artwork as well, which was cool with the Mexican vibes. Mm-hmm. That was cool. Um, trying to think what else. Number of the Beast artwork is is sick. I've got that poster framed in my room. Yeah, I mean, that's a very iconic one as well. Like if you look through them all that's one that's always stood out but i always remember like seeing it a lot on t-shirts from the early days of like first time i went to see iron maiden um i did really like the fear of dark artwork but now that you i'm i'm now like intrigued <laughs> and that is like if it was fan art or not, not that it changed it it's still really cool it changed your perception on it <laughs> i mean like the artwork really encaptures the album and the song so yeah i remember like when i was just getting into iron maiden and my dad was really excited that i was taking an interest in the things he liked we used because he's got all of maiden's discography and all of like the inside sleeves yeah especially on all of the early iron maiden illustrations by Derek riggs there's loads of like little hidden easter eggs on all the artwork and there's like okay. the same symbol in each one like hidden somewhere i remember we spent hours just like opening all the different um inside sleeves and like trying to find all the little like Derek riggs's logo on all of them yeah. and like sometimes there's a grim reaper hidden somewhere and especially in the um somewhere in time artwork there's loads of maiden easter eggs on it like there's fucking icarus falling from the sky in the corner the clock says two minutes to midnight there's Charlotte the Harlot in one of like the building windows. I did know about the two, the clock one in in that. There's I did loads. know about, but I didn't realize how many there was. There's so many. Next time you go and look at it, now you'll see everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I haven't got that CD on actual physical format. So how you can find it online? <laughs> oh, 100 percent. Yeah, true, true. Yeah, anything. <laughs> That that's probably like again like the connection with Final Frontier album is just like the first one that I had that was physical, so you actually like appreciate it more. Whereas if everything before I was just going onto YouTube and like listening, yeah. and that was even like Spotify was really a thing because it was just yeah I literally just lived on YouTube. That was how I learned anything or found out anything I knew about Iron Maiden. I did. I remember once. Um... I was like early secondary school and I obviously I had so much more time on my hands so the bands I got into when I was younger like I like I got obsessed with them like I did all my research I spent ages finding out all these little like easter eggs and stuff and I remember my parents caught me once like really late at night awake and up when I shouldn't have been and I was just reading the Iron Maiden Wikipedia page (laughs) nice yeah and like my mom was obviously pissed at me she was like you should be in bed you've got school in the morning and then my dad was like yeah you should go to bed and then the second my mom turned her head he was like you can keep reading it's fine yeah Yeah, that's cool (laughs) yeah so was that was that the first physical album you owned or had you owned more before that uh no (laughs) there was more before that the the first physical album i ever owned was busted (laughs) Oh, nice. So, yeah. 
but that was yeah busted was the first reason i wanted to pick up a guitar um and That's i'll cool. open it it was just that that era and that sort of age i was probably what like i don't know eight years old maybe mm -hmm. so and you just see some guy with a guitar and it looks cool and i'm like yeah i want to do that I, I did exactly the same thing like before i got into metal i was really into girls aloud <laughs> okay yeah. yeah yeah so you know like say same era same exactly yeah section yeah. of the industry and then like I said, I heard Maiden for the first time. I watched School of Rock for the first time. School of the Rock was amazing. And then, so like I had a couple of Girls Aloud CDs, but they had been bought for me. But the first album I bought myself was ACDC's The Razor's Edge. Okay. Back, yeah. back when Jersey had a HMV. Oh, uh, mate. H <laughs> HMV. <laughs> so sad. I was talking about this the other day, like even like... I miss the days of going into WH Smiths and buying Kerrang and buying Enemy and buying, and it's just so different now. I know. It, like it took me until 2020 to finally get Spotify and only because I got into the music industry. I put it off for so long. I didn't have Spotify for ages as well. I just like, I still went on, even if it wasn't, if it wasn't physical format, I still went on iTunes and bought albums. Mm-hmm. It's just like, so much nicer to like own something. Yeah, yeah. Even now, I still will. In uh, to be fair, I haven't as much recently, but in like the last maybe like four years, still bought so many physical albums because I like having something to keep. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I really use Spotify now for is I'll listen to something when it's out, and if I like it that much, which sometimes I do. Like if when I get into an album, I. I'd never get out of albums. Like you always hear about people that are like, oh, I overplayed that album so much now I can't listen to it. Never happens to me. So if I like yeah. an album, I will buy it. That's the same as me. Um, very bad for, it's not even albums. I'm really, really bad for getting so hooked on one song. Be mm -hmm. having it on repeat for days on end. Like at the moment, there's a, band called unpeople i'm not sure if you've come across them yet like they're they used to be called prestamico well oh, okay yeah, i've seen them two of the members from prestamico have now started unpeople two other people okay. and there's a lot of people then but yeah <laughs> <laughs> and they've released their first song called smother and it's just since it came out last week i've not stopped playing it oh, and i cool. know absolutely doing, doing my partner's head in like so bad it's just the first <laughs> On, on repeat well, I'm going to go check that one out now because I liked Prestamico, I saw them open for Shinedown, I think yeah, yeah. Good. Prestamico is so good but, but yeah, let me know what you think but this track yeah. is my opinion <laughs> okay, I have one more question for you and then I'll let you go um, not only are Iron Maiden's is Iron Maiden's merch game insane, but they also have their own beer now have yeah. you tried trooper beer before i haven't tried trooper beer oh. which is very surprising because i'm a man that has tried many beers <laughs> <laughs> but i have never tried it but i have like well i want to try it so and when i leave this i'm now going to buy some trooper beer i'm going <laughs> to listen to the project and that's what i've taken <laughs> you have to write a to-do list <laughs> yeah literally <laughs> How did I've... Think, hey, I've got some work to do now. <laughs> <From it. laughs> so I've like I've been I stopped drinking just after I turned 18, so I've actually been sober for like seven years. But occasionally, like if my mates are having cocktails, I'll like try a bit. My dad drinks trooper beer quite a lot. So obviously when that came out, I tried it. But even when I drank, I was never a big beer drinker. It had like a slight lemony taste to it. Okay. So that's the <laughs> give you I'm a little bit of expectations there. But lemony taste is in like a shandy or just no. No, it was kind of like more like an aftertaste, like a I don't know. I mean like I I don't like beer anyway, so I'm probably not the best person to describe it. <laughs> But yeah, there's slightly something slightly lemony about it, and they all come with like different 
bottle caps with um all the different album artworks on it and my dad's yeah. turned them all into magnets that's so cool there's a lot it's like it's like another little collector's item yeah that's really cool yeah yeah i recommend trying it isn't i might be wrong but isn't there a pub that steve harris used to frequent in east london that has trooper on draft as well yeah there's actually a couple of places that have trooper on draft i'm okay. not sure if they still do but when trooper yeah. first came out there was like yeah you, you would see it yeah. yeah i think you can get trooper in morrison's really i think so yeah I'm going somewhere tonight though. There's Morrison's, so we have to have a look. <laughs> yeah, it's our closest point, about half an hour away. So <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, that uh, was my that was my final question. So hope you had a good time chatting about Maiden with me. And thank you again for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I very much enjoyed. Thank you for listening to I'm Your Biggest Fan. If you enjoyed what you heard, please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, comment. Send it to your nan in the post. Every little helps. You can follow us everywhere at biggestfan underscore pod. Follow me everywhere at rathchild underscore jazz. Noise at Noise UK on everything. Noise Podcast Network at Noise Podcast Network on everything. And Satanic Tico at Satanic Tico and at Pitch Black Nor. If you have a band member in mind that you think would be perfect for this podcast, perfect for this topic of conversation, or maybe you are the band member and you're the super fan, Drop us a comment, drop us an email. All other info can be found below in the description. And thanks again for listening. We'll catch you soon.